Hello everyone, this is going to be 8.2, Reconstruction Changes the South, and we're going to start with the primary source from the first ever African American senator in the history of the United States, a man named Hiram Revels, who in his first speech inside the well of the U.S. Senate said, I bear about me daily the keenest sense of their weight, and that feeling prompts me now to lift my voice. Uh, the, I think the weight that he's talking about here is the weight of responsibility for all the other African Americans who are not senators at this moment. So our objectives, we are going to explain how Republicans gain control of the southern state governments, analyze how freedom, uh, or I'm sorry, how freedmen adjusted to freedom and the role of the Freedmen's Bureau. We're going to evaluate the South's new economic system and its impact on poor farmers. And we're going to summarize efforts to limit African Americans' rights and the federal uh, government's response to this as well. So let's start with Republicans dominating the government. And that's partially because there were very few Democrats around at this time. Most of them had left during the Civil War, and now they're vastly outnumbered by the Republicans. So by 1870, uh, a lot of the former states that had left to join the Confederacy had uh, met the requirements necessary to come back into the United States. However, the Republican Party, the party that had been with Lincoln and had won the Civil War, uh, basically ran the state governments in the southern states. They did this by joining forces. White Republicans joined forces with African Americans uh, who were now able to vote, and that created a very powerful voting bloc. Uh, and like I said, the, uh, the support of the newly freed slaves uh, were the reason that the Republicans were winning in the South. African-American freedmen were able to vote fully as one person, not as three-fifths of a person. Uh, and also African-American freedmen were serving in local state governments. So not only were African-Americans voting, but they were getting elected to state offices. They were becoming state congressmen, lieutenant governors, all the way up to senators. And we see that millions of African-American men could now vote, which meant that they could basically outvote the Southern Democrats at any time. Uh, many of them couldn't vote yet because they hadn't fully signed the loyalty oath uh, to be uh, welcomed back into the um, uh, United States. So for an example of one of these uh, lawmakers, we have Hiram Revels. Hiram Revels was born in somewhere around 1822. It's a little hard to say exactly when, and uh, lived until 1901. Uh, he was born in North, North Carolina, but moved to Mississippi, where he was uh, a senator from Mississippi, the first ever African-American senator or congressman. Uh, he was also the Secretary of State for Mississippi for a while. Uh, he was not born enslaved. He was born free in North Carolina. Uh, and later on in his life, after being a senator, he became the president of a historically black college called Alcorn State University. And here is uh, Hiram Revels with several other African American uh, congressmen and uh, governors and so on and so forth. A lot of these are some of the first African American lawmakers that we have in the United States. And here also is uh, a uh, Harper's Weekly from 1867 that shows uh, African-American men of uh, various classes and social groups uh, voting for the first time, including an old man who is most likely a former enslaved person, a much more better dressed man, uh, a soldier, and so on and so forth. Now, the Republican Party was also bringing in white men in the North and the South, although not many Southerners were joining the Republican Party. The South was primarily Democrats at this time, uh, and they did not like these sort of outsiders who were coming in and trying to, to change things in the South. So, for instance, the uh, Southern Democrats were not huge fans of a group called Scalawags. Scalawags were white Southerners who joined the Republican Party and were basically considered traitors uh, because they had resisted secession during the Civil War. Um, they also did not like Northern men who moved down South after the war uh, in order to change things, they were called carpetbaggers. Uh, and it's obvious that both scalawag and carpetbagger are not nice words. Uh, they are basically being used as insults. Both these groups were named by people who didn't like them. Um, carpetbaggers were not just white, though. They were also uh, freedmen and um, African Americans who had been born free, um, who had escaped to the North. Um, these uh, freedmen returned to the South and oftentimes did very well for themselves, which made them um, suspicious characters to white Southerners. 
So here's an obviously negative political cartoon of a southern political, uh, of a southern, of a uh, northern carpetbagger moving south. Uh, basically, they, they were thought of as moving in and sort of just causing trouble and or just trying to more or less pick the bones of the south. Now, one of the big disappointments for many women during this time period was that the Republican Party was supporting Reconstruction and supporting voting rights for African Americans. However, they were not supporting, vo supporting voting rights for women. Um, the argument that a lot of Republicans made was that basically we have enough power to do one thing. We have enough power to get voting rights for African Americans, or African American men, or we have enough power to make voting rights for women a thing. Uh, we can't do both. Uh, some women were able to find some opportunities in medical facilities, orphanages, and relief agencies, uh, and definitely as teachers, but also a lot of suffragists, uh, females who, women who wanted to get the right to vote, felt very burned by the fact that they were left out of the 15th Amendment. Now, Reconstruction did make it uh, mandatory, it made it, uh, you know, not voluntary for public schools to be available to all races. However, over time, we see that segregation starts to take over, and we see a separation of the races instead of an integration, which is a mixing of the races. Uh, and so, yes, there are public schools for uh, all races, however, they are separate public schools. We also see... Uh, that having two different public schools usually meant that the white school was well-funded while the African-American school was underfunded. Uh, there was also, whoops, sorry, there was also very little protection for African-Americans, uh, and we do see that uh, there is a rise in violence. We're going to see that with the rise of the KKK uh, in a little bit. Now, many people in both the North and the South were using their elected positions to sort of make money. This was what we call the Gilded Age, where there was a lot of political corruption, um, and bribery was common, and many people in the South just assumed that um, Republicans, especially carpetbaggers, scalawags, and African-American politicians were on the take, that they were corrupt, um, whether it was true or not. And so here we see uh, this woman labeled the South, the Solid South, being forced into servitude by the North, basically, uh, President Grant riding in on top of a carpet bag. Now, let's look at free people building their lives. Not everybody was going to be an elected official, but some people were just trying to make their lives better. So as Reconstruction continued, African American families worked to build new lives in this deep South. Um, some considered moving away from plantations if they could afford to or if they could get away, um, and they hoped to create new opportunities. Now, for the first time, uh, African-American weddings were being legally, legally recognized as legit. Um, before this, when they were enslaved, um, African-American marriages were not seen as real. We also see some new freedmen families traveled uh, to cities and out of the plantations looking for better jobs and maybe more personal liberty. Uh, however, even in cities, they still had to face discrimination uh, and definitely were usually paid less than, than whites. Most, however, could not get out because it costs money to leave, and they didn't have that money. Uh, and so most remain in farming areas working as laborers. Uh, so here is a Freedman wedding from 1866, a legit legalized wedding. Now, for many freedmen, one of the keys to getting out of the South or maybe, you know, getting to a better opportunity is education. So we see that uh, hundreds of thousands of people went to these newly built schools for freedmen. Um, it cost 10% of their monthly wage, but they said, you know what, it is worth it. Um, this is also times when uh, HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, are being built, and uh, they are going on to uh, basically educate the next generation of African-American leaders. The number of African-American churches and ministers also grew during this time, especially uh, what is called the AME, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, but also uh, just regular Methodist churches, Baptist churches, so on and so forth down the line. Now, this is Howard University. This is an early HBCU in Washington, D.C., named after Oliver Howard, who was the head of the Freedmen's Bureau. It was not the first, but it was one of the biggest. Now, let's also look at land distribution, how they separated the land during this time. 
uh, most of the wealth in the South was in land. It was in farming and agriculture. Um, and at the time, there were a lot of white people who owned the land and a lot of African Americans who did not. Uh, at this time, the wealthiest 5% owned basically half of the land in the South. So a few freedmen were able to kind of band together in order to um, consolidate their resources and buy uh, land. But for most African Americans, it was simply too expensive to do this. So most had to sort of fall back into what is uh, called sharecropping or share tenancy, um, where uh, the South turned to this as a way to um, fill up their farms. Sharecropping is a system in which uh, farmers, usually African-American, but also many poor whites, uh, worked for a landowner and they got to decide what crop was grown, uh, or I'm sorry, the landowner got to decide what crop was grown. Uh, and uh, the landowner also gave them tools and housing, uh, and the farmers would share their crops. They would pay the landowner with part of their crops, uh, and usually the sharecroppers would lose money on this, which meant that they were more or less locked into this, what seemed very much like servitude. There's also share tenancy. This is a system in which farmers at least had the right to choose what crop they were growing, um, and uh, they had more variety in what they could grow, and maybe, maybe, maybe could save a little money extra on the side. Um, lastly, there's what's called tenant farming. Uh, this was the option with the most independence for the poorer farmer. Uh, the farmer would pay cash, not crops, uh, in rent to the landowner, and they could manage their own choices, their own crops, and so on and so forth. However, the downside is in order to be a tenant farmer, you had to have enough money to be a tenant farmer. And most African Americans, heck, most Southerners, did not have, you know, hard currency on them. Um, that was really hard to get your hands on during this time. So here are some Southern sharecroppers in 1907. Now, let's look at changes that sparked violence in the South. I'm sorry, I think I might miss... Nope, good, didn't miss any slides. Good. Uh, so... Uh, whites in the South were already upset about having to share what they thought of as their land with newly freed enslaved people, uh, newly freed uh, freedmen now, um, and also the fact that some freedmen were doing well and making money and being a success also made them just even more angry. A lot of white Southerners from social classes, rich, poor, uh, what have you, in the South sort of banded together to make sure that African Americans wouldn't receive their full rights as citizens. They were worried that basically if African Americans became too powerful, they would uh, basically gain supremacy over whites. That was their mindset, that there is there is no living equally, there is no living fairly. It's just, you know, uh, it's going to become, uh, like they said in the documentary Many Rivers to Cross that we watched, black supremacy would overtake white supremacy. And there were groups of Southerners who banded together to violently oppose African Americans, uh, the m most famous of which is, or infamous, is the Ku Klux Klan, formed in Tennessee in 1868, uh, or 1866. Uh, they did so as a way to intimidate, force, threaten, and, if necessary, harm and kill African Americans to keep them away from voting booths and to force them back into more traditional uh, servant roles. The KKK especially went after symbols of freedom and success. They went after churches, they went after schools, they went after uh, wealthy men, politicians, people who owned carriages, because that was seen as a symbol of wealth. So here are some early KKK members. In response to all this violence, as violence was growing, Congress and uh, the president, Ulysses S. Grant, passed the Enforcement Acts, also known as the Ku Klux Klan Acts of 1870 and 71. These acts made it a federal offense to interfere with a person's civil rights, uh, and it also gave the federal government the right to step in and protect the rights of, uh, of citizens within the South. However, the problem is this only worked as long as there were U.S. soldiers in the area. As soon as the soldiers left, the violence picked right back up again. So here is a uh, political cartoon by the great Thomas Nast. He's everywhere. Um, 
known as the Union as it was, otherwise known as the Lost Cause, worse than slavery. We'll talk about the Lost Cause in class, but it shows African Americans being oppressed. You see an African American being lynched uh, by members of uh, both the White League, which was sort of a uh, proto-KKK militia, and also the KKK as well. 